There's so much about the polio story that is about synchronicity, serendipity, things that just coincidentally happen and some amazing thing happens. And that's the story of the Duncan family. Look, if you haven't read this, this is actually a book published by the Duncan family telling the history of the Duncan family and you've got to read it. It's just an incredible story. The whole Duncan family had been involved in just so many good works. You know, I mean, it's all in the book. You've got to read it. It's fantastic. Every New Zealander should read that book. But the story I want to mention today is about Thomas Andrew Duncan, T.A. or Tommy, a well-dressed sheep farmer from Hunterville and his wife, Jenny. And their serendipity that changed the world of polio in New Zealand and their legacy that continues to change the world of polio in New Zealand today. His grandparents, I think it was, came out from England, established sheep farms, with extraordinary stories about how they established their sheep farms and so forth. But his grandson and a friend's child got polio. And he was told there was nothing they can do. There's no cure and pretty much get polio you've pretty much had it but he wanted to read about it so he's he did his own study he and he found out about sister kenny's treatment which at the time was reporting compared to the orthodox methods of treating polio the results she was getting was uh, and amazing and he had read about this but what to do about that and him and his wife Jeannie really wanted to do something but didn't know what to do but knew that there were things happening overseas and they wanted to help they were successful sheep farmers. But what to do? There was outbreaks every summer. So the hospitals were struggling. It was the summer of 1942. The Wellington Hospital was already overwhelmed with polio patients. Polio had become a really big concern. Because this is one of these incredible serendipity things. Tommy had taken the train to Wellington for a business meeting. And he ended up sitting next to Gwen Dryden, who was a sister at a Wellington hospital. And he started talking to her about this Kenny treatment and what she knew and da da da. Well, by the time they got to Wellington, everything had changed because those two people had met. What ended up happening was, is Tommy ended up paying for Gwen to go to America to meet Sister Kenny, to train under her, and to come back here. and. And the outcome of it, I mean, really, that train trip that day birthed hospital in New Zealand dedicated to treating polio, particularly children. What if, it, what if she'd taken an earlier train? What if he had, you know, I mean, it's just like there's so many things. Of course, the tra- Kenny treatment was a controversial thing still at that point. And so she was suspicious because she was from orthodox medical background and so forth. But she went, met Sister Kenny worked with her, came back an absolute convert, and her and Tommy and Jeannie, they founded the first hospital for polio. Even beyond their passing, they left their legacy. Their grandson, David, and Vicky, his wife, are our patrons of Polio New Zealand. Their son, Joe, picked up his great-grandfather's impulse. Joe Duncan's involvement is another one of these serendipity stories. Joe got talking to Dr. Richard Four. Pretty much we all know who he is. He's been to talk at our conferences. I'll tell you what Wikipedia says about him. He is Sir Richard Lewis Maxwell Four, is a New Zealand neuroscientist and academic who specialises in human neurodegenerative disease. He's a professor of anatomy and director of the Centre for Brain Research at the University of Auckland. So he's a big deal. He talked to Joe about the huge gaps for the treatment and rehabilitation of neurological disorders in New Zealand. So that got Joe thinking about um, what to do and how to how to serve that. And at the same time, Gordon had um, come on the board of Polio New Zealand and had put together a plan for establishing specialist facilities in New Zealand to address this shortfall for polio. And he put together this presentation, a proposal to Thomas and Lady Duncan Trust to ask for their support for this plan. Joe came home to visit his parents and lying on the coffee table was Gordon's proposal. And 
light reading, I suppose. He picked it up, read it, and the, the rest of it is history in terms of him and Gordon working together. What if Joe hadn't gone to visit his parents when that thing was laying on the coffee table? I love it. I love this sort of stuff. Anyway, that's all history. Let's talk to Gordon about what's actually going on today. I thought for, the, for today's session, it would be good for you to explain the Duncan Foundation, what it is, why it's been established, what the vision is, and how that's going to dovetail with um, Polio New Zealand, or at least, you know, in terms of what we set up in our strategic plan, a heck of a lot of it's now being fulfilled via the Duncan Foundation. I think it'd be good for people to understand that. Okay, well, the Duncan Foundation, um, really, Joe Duncan, the great-grandson of Sir Thomas and Lady Duncan, had the initial idea of the Duncan Foundation and was putting that together with Julie Rope. And so while I was program manager, I worked with um, Joe and Julie and and, uh, others to develop the whole concept of the, of the Duncan Foundation. So it really is like a modern 21st century incarnation of the Duncan hospitals uh, in the 40s and 50s. Only they really want to look at everybody with neuromuscular conditions, not confined to polio. Whatever the cause is, the outcome is the same for many, many people. So what the Duncan Foundation does at the moment is that we have four places where we run clinics and then people can... Um, and get assessments, referrals if extra referrals are needed, and develop a rehabilitation plan. And the conditions that we are supporting is, besides people with the late effects of polio, it's recently diagnosed Parkinson's um, disease, Frederick's ataxia, and dystonia. We will widen that to uh, a range of other neuromuscular conditions. At the moment, we really have to develop the expertise um, in each of those and the relationships with the DHBs around the country that we're working with. At the moment, we, we just actually got charity registration on Wednesday for the Duncan Foundation. So now we can start to set up the whole infrastructure that to run that. You know, people should appreciate that this is early days yet. And so, in a sense, we are the guinea pigs in determining what sort of support people need and how we can get that support for people. So the Duncan Foundation will also be looking at various areas of research educating uh, doctors and other health professionals about neuromuscular conditions, then asking the government to see if they can update their systems to include our needs on a reasonable basis. So really, in a short space of time, that, that's the sort of Duncan Foundation. We have a website at www.duncanfoundation.org. Yeah. There, people can go if they need a clinical uh, appointment, can go in there and register and then it will get back to you to follow that through. You have to be warned that demand has probably outstripped our supply at the moment, so there probably will be waiting lists. But we will certainly get back to everybody and go from there. Cool. And so the long-term vision is like when you feel like it's all in place, what's it going to look like? Well, one of our ambitions is to have our services available to everybody within 100 kilometres of where they live um, in New Zealand. And while we probably won't in, increase the number of specialist clinics where we do assessments, those clinicians will travel to the regions. And then we'd look at setting up rehab support hubs in various other centres. And these places can support people in their plans for rehab they might have. For instance, with my own dynamic braces, I've now started a physio class at our local DHB. And it's fantastic what they're doing and giving me the support I need to really learn how to use these braces. So we plan to integrate with the health services where we can and as much as possible in existing services and find pathways for people to get those. Can you describe just a little bit so people understand, when you make an appointment mm. at one of these clinics, what can you expect? It, what happens? Well, when you register, that's not the same as making an appointment. That means that they'll contact you. And first of all, we have to understand that people have one of those four conditions. So at the moment, we can't accept people, uh, Gillian Barre or MS or a number of other things that we hope to in the future. So then you'll get contacted by somebody from the clinic. They will then ask you to fill out a pre-assessment form, which gives them information that will make their assessment much easier and more efficient. Then set up a time for appointment. The first thing is a, probably an hour and a half where they do an assessment and then look at what further needs you might have for any other type of assessment or referrals. And then 
come back again and look at developing a, a plan that's your priorities and what you need to support that. And then a, another follow-up to see that that's underway. At the moment, we haven't got other specific services lined up because that's the next phase of what we're doing. So we, we sort of set people on the journey and then we want to go on that journey with you and look at how we can develop the support mechanism. In some places, they had group classes where people were doing exercise. Others might be fatigue management. Others may be looking at group work or therapy work or whatever. Uh, it, it just depends. Certainly referral to orthotics. We have Marmaduke Loke now looking at getting dynamic braces for a number of people. That's not funded by the Duncan Foundation, although my time in supporting that at the moment is. Uh, there's a... You know, we will expand our services. It's early days. We've only been registered two days and we're up and up, we're operating. So I think we're doing pretty good. So so you're saying that the assessment that gets done at that first appointment, that's just a physical assessment? Of... No, no, no. It's a thorough assessment in terms of looking at history. And that can, if necessary, extend into another session if we want to do detailed muscle assessments and other specific things that, that take a time. So that's up. That, it, people differ. I'm going to have to stop now. Yeah, I've got to go pretty soon, actually. I think yep. that's about it. So just to, just to briefly um, sum up, the, yeah. they go to the Duncan Foundation website and yeah. register and then go to, if they want an assessment, go and click on well, one of the clinics. No, no, if they register and they say they want to, and that indicates which clinic you'd like to go to, they will then get a contact back from those people. Oh, I see. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay.